So in this video I'm going to show you why the so-called glorious thousands years long history, ancient history of China is nothing else but fiction, bedtime stories. As you read those bedtime stories you will be left with the impression that they are based on some sort of old chronicles. What kind of chronicles? The oldest Chronicles, at least amongst those that we have actual access to, are barely two or three hundred years old. Also, they want you to believe that the stories are based on some sort of very ancient recorded astronomical observations. So, I'm going to show you what is the so-called proof of that. And these observations are actually very recent and the oldest horoscope that they have is barely some 300 years old. To fix the problem with the obvious lack of correlation between the historic artifacts and the so-called history, genuine historic sites are in this condition, lettuce garden, while so-called historic artifacts, like the Great Wall of China, which is actually still being built, it's very modern, are loudly advertised by the historians and the tourist agencies. And yes, uh, in China there are actual historic ruins of various walls. But isn't it strange that the arrow slits at some of them are in direction China and not in the direction of the imaginary invaders. Now, the Chinese people did have a actual history and records, but when the military force arrived, as usual from Europe, same story as in America, as in Japan in the previous episodes, and it will be repeating itself in Egypt and all the future episodes again and again, their priority was to erase the history. So what they used in China was to drug the local population, literally to the point that they forgot who they are. That's how the traditional history was substituted with the mainstream fairy tales, and that's why historic sites like this with high-tech tool marks are ignored. And maybe that's why they found the modern artifact in a so-called very All the grottos and caves we've seen so far are included in the official history of China. The historians find some place for them. If needed, they make up their own hypothesis and then present it as fact, but somehow they fit them in somewhere. But when it comes to the Kua Shun and Long Q cases, total silence. Mainstream historians 
strongly prefer that they are not even mentioned at all at any cost. They classify them as mysterious or more beautiful words like magical grotto of theological nuggets. Well, scientists weren't really versed in magic, right? How can they say this is magical? What does magical mean to them, anyway? The actual reason to avoid any discussion about these caves are the tool marks left by the equipment used in them. Now, compare the high-tech looking marks from China with this quarry from Estonia, which is barely 100 years old. And still, the marks on the wall are very chaotic. And now, compare the historic Chinese tool mark with the latest modern equipment tool mark. The network of labyrinths is so vast that it stretches uh, over tens of kilometers. Practically an entire mountain is made hollow. There is no trace of the stone that was taken out, which of course should have been the size of a mountain itself. Was it taken off-site or was it spread around by one of the great floods? It seems the Chinese had a good record of their own history before the fairy tales were forced with military power and drugs upon them by the European colonialists. There are plenty of references to advanced technology in the traditional Chinese chronicles. They had metal flying dragons that were transporting beings throughout the universe, not just Earth. There were metal servants that they were using to do the hard work, which we would today call robots. And their mass media was much more informative than ours, because they were well aware of the developments of the war between the parasites and the humans. For example, they reported in their chronicles that at one point, some of the non-earthly beings involved in this conflict closed off contact between Earth people and their allies, the godly beings of the universe. It really appears that, compared to the Chinese people of the past, we are in an informational blackout these days. According to the Chronicles, even the first emperor of China himself was a non-earthly being. And this is supposedly the burial pyramid of his son. Although both the father and the son didn't exist, according to modern scholars, they assure us that they got buried. However, they were never born. Wikipedia even says that this is the only pyramid in China, which is extremely strange given the fact that China is the home of hundreds of pyramids, some of them very, very large. They aren't open for research, but they leave the impression that they are made mostly of earth. But there are stone pyramids as well. Now let's visit an actual ancient historic site in China to see how it matches the history. <clears throat> it looks kind of newish to me for a person who lived 8,000 years ago. It looks as new as the pavement around it, doesn't it? So here is the information about the actual structure. So the emperor lived 8,000 years ago, but only in the imagination of the people. Then they made a tome for him 1,000 years ago. And as far as the actual thing, it says, 
When the tomb was renovated 300 years ago, the entire complex had long disappeared. Pardon, this is not renovation, this is building from scratch. So 300 years ago somebody made something pyramidal here, probably the stones we see actually are 20 or 30 years old, if not much less. And this is uh, shown to the people as an evidence of the many thousands years long history of China. And also this type of sites are shown to the tourists as uh, being 2000 years old. How come the wood didn't rot or petrify? This is not in a desert area. These structures were recovered from the damp soil and if they were indeed that old, they should have completely rotten by now. And then a Swiss watch found in a 400 year old Chinese tomb. And then the red herring of time travel, probably that's what it is. Not that finding out the truth about time travel is less important than finding out the truth of our origin, but when we are sent to the wrong address to look for the wrong thing, we won't find out the truth, neither about time travel nor the dating of the actual tome. Mummies of tall Caucasian and often very beautiful people are found also in China. But yet their role in Chinese history is largely or completely ignored. And the reason for that doesn't seem to be that uh, currently the Asian race resides there, even in places like Australia, New Zealand, Egypt, South America, where actual Caucasian people live even nowadays, still such mummies are found and they are always excluded from history. So it seems to be a centrally managed thing. And by the way, in the modern countries where people of this type, tall and white, still live, the project aiming at replacing this type of population with other people are still carried out under the flag of fighting racial discrimination. All kinds of rules and laws are enacted. And if you read them carefully and see them in action, you will always, always notice that they create that discrimination. They start with talk about equality and end up with rules which favor only one certain group. After observing all these discrepancies between actual artifacts and history in the books, one starts wondering how did this uh, commonly accepted history of China appear anyway? Well, the first uh, written historic chronicles of China date from the 17th century, when for the last time all old books were gathered by the ruling dynasty, they were burned down and a new history was composed because the old one didn't comply with the agenda of those in power at the given moment. There's no need to search for alternative sources. In the chronicles themselves, it is said how they appeared. In the 17th and 18th century, there was a lot of activity going on in terms of establishing or creating the Chinese history. The history of the previous dynasties was unacceptable to the current one. And that is why there was the need to create private histories. That is what they called it. In the year 1772, the government collected every printed book ever issued in China. The process of gathering all the books continued for 20 years. The committee that oversaw the collection of the books consisted of 360 men. 
all books were separated into four categories. After a couple of years, 3,457 of them were printed again in a new form. And the rest of them, mainly 6,766, were only catalogued, but some under different names. And this complete rewriting and issuing of completely new books happened at least three or four times in the history of China. We don't know exactly how many times, because there were no records from one rewrite to another. And each time there was a language reform, which made it very difficult for the people to understand the older hieroglyphs. The hieroglyphic writing of China is one consisting of symbols, and as people were forced into language reforms, they not only lost a part of their history, which could no longer be recovered from the old chronicles, even if they wished to, but most importantly, they were losing connection with the paradigm of the advanced old civilizations which uh, laid the bedrock of their culture. So what is the aftermath of these uh, language reforms and uh, writing of private histories? Anybody who has tried to read uh, the chronicles that are available anonymously agrees that uh, this is uh, the most chaotic and unsystematic historical record that they can imagine. So these murky waters of the history of China gave scope to the modern history fabricators to run their imagination wild. And they did so without any pang of conscience whatsoever. And so we read about fairy tale kingdoms that existed thousands of years ago. And what is the dating based on? I would really like you to show you the basis of their dating. The basis are quote, the well-recorded, sophisticated astrological observations that were running in an interrupted line in China for thousands of years. Now please pay very close attention because I'm gonna show you those continuous records of sophisticated observations. Here is the proof in its entirety. I'm really not joking, this is taken from uh, this um, book, uh, a very respected mainstream history book uh, that is a uh, product of international uh, research. And here is how they explain it to us. These are not some um, parts of a clay pot vessel, these are astronomical records and observations of sunspots are recorded on them. And because these uh, pieces of uh, clay pot must be, they say, must be uh, at least uh, 5,000 years old, uh, that uh, shows undoubtedly that <clears throat> the Chinese at that time had uh, sophisticated observatories marking and studying and uh, recording the uh, sunspots activity. And by the way, how did they conclude that these pieces are whatever, five or uh, four thousand years old? Well, that's not even mentioned in their so-called research. That is just uh, given as an axiomic fact of uh, the existence that cannot be doubted for any reason. But this superb historic comedy doesn't end here. They continue. Well, this isn't the only proof. There are other proofs of their sophisticated observatories of the ancient Chinese. And what is that? A Neolithic hero has been unearthed in Piyang in Hunan, China. On both sides of the buried skeleton, two mosaics were found, made of seashells. One of them anger, and the other a dragon. Somebody expressed the opinion that these shells could be placed there, keeping in view the positions of the stars. And since this Neolithic burial should be some 5,000 years old, from this we can conclude that the uh, astronomical observations of the Chinese have started at least 5,000 years before Christ. 
and I didn't make it uh, concise. That was the full research, that was the full proof on which they base uh, the dating of the dynasties that they found in the unsystematic chronicles. But I can tell you in short what is the rest of the book about, with one very good example. Uh, for example, there is somewhere in this chronicle a mention that uh, the people gathered and watched how the stars are aligned in the sky. And that means that they watched a special alignment apparently that happens every five or six thousand years and it occurred exactly five thousand years ago and they watched exactly that. How did they guess it? There is no mention in where were the planets, in what alignment, in what degree. There is nothing. Basically, it says the people were watching the sky because there was something happening there. And on the basis of all this so-called scientific research, it has been established that these glorious Chinese kingdoms happened thousands of years ago. While in reality, we have almost no clue what was happening in China before 17th century even, what to speak of thousands of years ago. On one side, the Chinese historic records were corrupted by continuous language reforms and burning of old books. On the other hand, the general population was uh, helped into forgetting the original advanced culture that they had some connection with by rewriting their hard disk with the help of opium. The British could not colonialize uh, China and that is why they had to find an alternative uh, method to undermine their culture from inside by poisoning them. Not all drugs are poisonous and addictive but uh, the way opium was used in this case was absolutely negative. And although modern interpretations of uh, the full development with the uh, cunning introduction of opium in China by the British is always presented as some sort of uh, economic um, operation for profit, please don't forget that it is the smaller players who are after money, those who only fulfill orders. Those who are on the top are not after money because they issue money, they create money. They can create as, money, as much money as they want for themselves and they do it by simply printing more and more and giving them to friends who would do them favors in exchange. So those on the very top were not chasing monetary profit their aim was lowering the human consciousness, erasing the human memory and rewriting the very definition of what human is. Because the original humans were being of goodness, being that naturally live in harmony with nature and the cosmos. Well, that full setup of happiness and harmony did not fit well with the, the new paradigm that was uh, artificially imposed upon the humans. Amongst the artifacts of uh, Chinese culture called Hongshan, we find this interesting statue very much resembling an Egyptian goddess or the samurais we saw in the previous episode or Lord Shiva from India. He is also depicted with a crescent in his uh, hair, so it looks also very similar to this. And of course the mummies and many other similarities in elements of art and culture of any sort prove that the Chinese were well connected with the world and this uh, worldwide culture. I may call them survivors, others call them gods, deities or even aliens. But don't be confused by the different names. At the end it boils down to the same thing. Tall beings who came and mixed with the simple local tribes and taught them philosophy, art, crafts and culture. But from those relatively far away times, sadly we don't have any records uh, from China due to the book burning and writing of so-called private histories after that. 
The earliest uh, relatively reliable records that we have are from the Mantra dynasty. Now it really seems that these uh, Mantra people were the last wave of survivors. First of all, they were foreigners. Their language is uh, alive till nowadays in some villages. So we know for sure their language is radically different from Chinese. <laughs> Just look at the architectural style of the Mantra people and there will be no questions left in terms of their origin. No, this is not a mistake. These are ruins in China, not in Europe. And by the way, there is linguistic evidence that originally the very name of the dynasty Mantra originated from Mogul. And those are the same uh, moguls that uh, were the last wave of survivors in India. And uh, currently they are on purpose confused with the Mongols. The people of nowadays Mongolia were certainly part of this uh, worldwide culture. And certainly its influence was uh, stronger as we said in East and Central Asia where Mongolia is located. But to put an equation mark between the modern Mongolians and the Mongols or Mongols mentioned in the older texts is a mistake. For example, in the Chinese chronicles that we are talking about, this is the description of the Mongols. Very tall white people with blonde hairs and blue eyes. And that's how all other contemporary writers describe them. So, how do the mainstream historians read these chronicles? Exactly like the devil reads the Bible. Aha, so here it says, Mongolians lived in China. Correct, yes. Mongolia is close to China, so there was some mixture, yes. And they don't even tell you that it is not Mongolians, but Mongols. And as far as the description of the outer appearance of these Mongols, that's deleted just skipped, as if it is not there. The Manchus themselves claimed that they are descendants of a dynasty which ruled over the entire earth. That would be kind of a ridiculous and out of place uh, claim if they were indeed the small insignificant tribe that the mainstream historians are convincing. Uh, they were so obscure that nobody even ever recorded anything about them. But such a claim would be completely normal if the Mantras were indeed descendants of the rulers of Tartaria, who seem to have had the last connection with Hyperboreans. And by the way, a lot of the material in this episode is just uh, concise quotes from the works of Anatoly Fomenko. A lot of it is translated in English and published for free on his website. So if you want to find a lot more interesting stuff, you can visit the website. And by the way, the Manchu dynasty ended up in China again fleeing from Siberia, or at least some part of them. Some other records suggest that others come from the nowadays Macedonian territories. It was most likely an international gathering of survivors. Part of them went to Japan and founded the Samurai dynasties. Yet another division of these warriors settled in China. So what were they fleeing from? Why did they abandon their homeland? It was like this. In the older times, there were no countries in the sense that we have them nowadays. There were just tribes and nations. But as the parasitic influence was increasing, countries started to appear. The parasites began to use the tactic of divide and conquer amongst those countries to have the people kill themselves, rather than having an all-out war against the parasites. When the survivors also found themselves already in such a situation, 
they also had to make some sort of a country and that was Tartaria which was uh, immediately broken into pieces and then these pieces were defeated separately the last standing one or at least one of the last standing was in Siberia and when the last piece of Tartaria was um, defeated by the newly formed Russia the general population simply remained to live on the land where it was born and gradually its uh, memory was uh, washed away by the mass media but the army, the military force they didn't wish to settle of such life which seemed like slavery to them and instead decided to flee to relative safety China and Japan there are some remnants of uh, their style of combat these are the Eastern martial arts since all records about Tartaria have been meticulously destroyed we know very little about these things although they happened relatively recently but um, whatever little is in the works of Anatoly Fomenko I'm presenting it here at that time the king of Tartaria was murdered and there was only a young prince left maybe the army took him to a relative safety to Japan or China Another interesting uh, detail from the Chinese chronicles is that these uh, Manchur people were foreigners and they were of a very small number. They were trying desperately not to mix with the local population, but since they were so few, their assimilation within uh, the local race became inevitable and was just a question of time. And here comes a very curious note from these Chinese chronicles. It says that after the Manchurs got assimilated by the locals, they lost their special abilities, like psychic abilities to fight. I find this very, very important. So maybe the Tartarians still had some uh, special abilities that they learned from uh, the Hyperboreans or they had a lot of uh, like mixture with the Hyperborean blood uh, flowing in their veins that's why they had their special abilities Now what about all the other Numerous Chinese dynasties, which according to the mainstream story, ruled China for many thousands of years. Although nothing can be said for sure, as mentioned previously, the chronicles are very confused and disorderly, but um, I'm gonna present to you the hypothesis of Anatoly Fomenko, which seems to be the most sensible one until we have any additional information at least. So when the Manchu people came to China, they wrote down the history of their own dynasty, which happened in different lands. And uh, that was their history, so they wrote down their history. And later on, when all this writing of so-called private histories and confused chronicles started, Possibly now um, actually dynasties which existed at other geographical locations and not China are now viewed as Chinese dynasties and there are s quite few points uh, supporting this hypothesis for example um, there were Huns in this uh, history now, the Huns, the Hungarian Huns, they are in Europe. Okay, just one name cannot confirm anything, but the neighbors of the uh, Huns were the Serbi. Now, Serbs, uh, these are the Serbian people in their own language, they call themselves Serbi. Uh, so they are the neighbors of the Hun, and then on the north, so the Chinese chronicles also talk about the tribe of Chehi, Cheshi, 
that's how the Czech people call themselves. Um, yeah, so what about Czechs in China in, in mainstream um, <clears throat> terms? All these tribes, uh, the mainstream history has one solution for all of them. Well, they existed in the past and now they have disappeared. Did they disappear, all of them? Or maybe they are well and living in Europe? The north of uh, where the dynasties were ruling, I mean, were the Sveni or Sveni. And this is how the Nordic people of Sweden call themselves. And they certainly are located in the north, but it would make more sense if you are, um, let's say, in Europe and you say they are in the north. If uh, the chronicles were written for China as we know it today, that would be East. So these are just some resemblances in terms of the names of the tribes. Now they are, uh, there is a lot common in the events which happen in this Chinese history. Too many parallels with the European history. It is very interesting. Again, if you wish, you can find it for free online in the works of Anatoly Fomenko, probably also in English. But it's not good to study history only from books. Let's go there, on the spot. Uh, at last I would uh, like to present you an interesting uh, blog that I found of a real person who decided to visit the town of Gunyi in China because uh, the biggest burial complex is located there and it supposedly belonged to an emperor called Zhen Tsuan. These are a few old photos of this location. <laughs> Well, it all looked uh, very different nowadays. In the beginning it was uh, kind of okay, like uh, these photos. But when he started walking around, he discovered that uh, the Chinese can have a very practical attitude towards history. Even the very shrine of the emperor, or maybe this belongs to the queen or some nobility, something like that, but it is a supposedly ancient shrine, even that can have very practical applications. Also, his uh, very journey to the town of uh, Gyan is very informative as of the current uh, culture in China. To reach the town, he took a local bus for a journey some 40 kilometers long. And he was hoping he'll be there in an hour or so, however, it took him a full day. How is that possible? Well, due to the innovative um, marketing strategies of uh, the person who is responsible for selling the tickets on the bus. So this lady made the bus stop at every corner and she would get down and try to convince the bypassers that they have to go to Gyan today. Well, people were trying to refuse because obviously they must have had some other agenda in their mind. That's why they went on the street going somewhere else. But she would not take no, no for an answer. She would actually try to drag them to the bus. Well, the innocent uh, women were screaming, but some of the stronger men even tried to defend themselves. To me, it really looks like something cast out of beton. 
And probably that's what it is exactly, as we are gonna see in the next episode, I believe. Well, this is uh, China today. Hopefully the modern Chinese people <clears throat> will do something about it. Otherwise, all the glorious kingdoms which lasted 8,000 years may suffocate under a couple of meters of plastic bags. There are roughly three to four times more pyramids in China, at least visible ones, than in Egypt. And in addition, they are in a much, much better condition of preservation than the Egyptian ones. And yet, not many are aware of this, what to speak of uh, finding out more details about them. And that's next to impossible. Even on the spot, people have tried over there in China. And usually, if you try, for example, to take photographs from nearby, very quickly some Chinese will emerge from somewhere and uh, make it clear that you can't do that. Actually, the Chinese even admitted that they have pyramids when people started uh, flying on airplanes and uh, too many photographs of them emerged. Before that, China denied having any pyramids. We don't have any pyramids. And the situation with the geoglyphs is even more interesting. I don't know if uh, they are more in terms of quantity than the Nazca geoglyphs, but they are certainly more informative, so to say, because many of them appear to be functional, if I can say so, and they are connected, plugged in, to modern installations of some sort. And so is one of their pyramids, at least one. So there was somebody who made very interesting documentaries about this. And um, yeah, recently his uh, channel doesn't uh, exist anymore. His uh, website also is, uh, doesn't exist and uh, blogs, everything has simply vanished. So I will uh, leave a link in the description to some remains of his work. I'm trying only to touch topics which may allow my channel to exist uh, longer. Lately, the measures taken against people who speak the truth are getting tighter and tighter people who are telling the truth about what's going on on the world political scene have their websites blocked. When people type in the web address, a message pops up for your own security. Uh, do not continue. There is malware, there is phishing attempts, spamming and all these types of things. Well, the reality is that the given website has only the truth, no malware, no spam. So everything seems to be allowed in the universe and everybody has freedom. So the people, most of the people, don't mind, don't know and don't care that the truth is suppressed in such way. And this situation is uh, very advantageous for certain parties who surely won't hesitate to explore it further and I guarantee you that very rapidly we'll be descending into informational darkness, abyss. Whatever you hear, whatever you see, everything will be a lie. You won't be able to trust your own eyes even. Because in one of my recent videos we saw how certain filters can be put in front of the image of the sun. It can get dark, it can blink when it gets dark. When it gets black, it doesn't get dark on Earth. So all this could be similar to some sort of um, circus magic. So who knows, maybe the skies will be turned into a gigantic monitor where all kinds of deceit holograms 
will be shown to us. But our own will and desire is the most important thing. And those who have made a different choice, who in their heart have decided that they have zero tolerance for any type of lies and deceit, these are the people who will always refuse to take part in violence and crimes, no matter what kind of reasons and explanations they will be offered in order to be enticed into such things. They will have the power to see through all the lies, even though everybody else around will believe the deceit which will pour from all newspapers, radio and TV stations. And these are not predictions based on the Bible, these are predictions made on the basis of what has been happening to people who speak the truth within the last couple of weeks. Oh, 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 oh.